Hello and welcome at the Museum of La Uvillano, where the main site of excavations of uh, Professor Uwe was, and where he contributed massively to the uh, catalogues, the expositions, and to our knowledge about the place. So we'll take a little look around uh, the museum. And for a little context, this was the main uh, location of the Legio II Italica, which in late antiquity was the only legion stationed in this province here of Noricum Rivense. And yeah, this was their main place of garrison, and let's take a look at all the findings. So, here we see the vexilla of the middle imperial time of the second legion, which was stationed here. And these were designed by Professor Ubel and then crafted according to his specifications and designs. Here we have the gravestone um, of a soldier of the Second Legion. The grave was erected uh, by the signifer of the Legion, who himself was from today Celje in today's uh, uh, Slovenia. Here we have a very interesting vitrine for late antiquity. Here, for example, the cheek piece of a helmet, which is dated to the late 3rd and the 4th century. Um, it's made of bronze. Here we have another cheek piece that is dated to the 3rd century. Some closing for probably a segmentata. And here we have um, scales from the 4th century or the late 3rd century. You see how tiny they are. It's really fascinating. We have some like these also in Carnuntum and in several other places on the Danubian Limes. So this seems to be quite a standardized size. And here remains of a chain mail um, and what's interesting it's, it says here iron and bronze so there's a mixture there also very interesting shield buckle and handle from late antiquity you see the very very big nails that were used to fix the the umbo to the shield you see this rather massive um, bronze sheet uh, to hold the wooden handle. Here's little decorative shields. They think they might have been part of a horse harness. Very nice and typical belt set of the third century. Absolutely frequently found. And here we have a belt set from late antiquity. Very typical form for belt buckles at the time. Here, very famous Kapschnitt Garnitur, quite big Tierkopfschnalle propellers. Here, the most famous belt set from Lauriacum, which has been recently recreated by Markus Neidhardt, which you can get in his shop. A really amazing reconstruction of this original. Some more belt parts. These very typical strap ends for the 4th century you find all over the empire. Very large and quite massive propellers. Actually much more massive than what we usually see in reenactment. Here we have a lot of material from the 2nd and 3rd century. A really massive pugio. This is on the verge of being a sword. It is absolutely huge. Very nicely crafted. Handles from bone. Very slim little sword here. It's almost like a, a early renaissance or 
early baroque weapon typical Valdeus pieces of the 3rd century you find them everywhere also we have this also in Canuntum in the museum very very similar many other places here very famous Valdeus and also recreated by Marcus Neidhardt available in his shop This quite short and thin blade has been dated to the 4th century also. Very fascinating. It's got a quite broad tongue here. It could be a 3rd century sword as well. well it's quite short and thin. I'd love to have it replicated. And here we have a skull with a very obvious and pronounced battle mark. You can see where the sword hit the skull. Spearheads dated mostly to the 3rd and 4th century. Very typical form for the 4th century indeed. These sort of blade shaped spear points. Here we got something from the first and second century. Something like a bolt. Some more bolts from late antiquity. Something like an angle tip. Some plumbata. Very nice, and we see the diversity here. Very differently shaped. Almost no two pieces the same. Really great diversity in craftsmanship. very popular tips from late antiquity. Typical 3rd century armor, very ornate. Some rests of greaves, also very, very ornate. These are all commemorative stones and gravestones for members of the 2nd Legion. So here we see the actual route that I am attempting to walk to Carnuto. And at the start of the week, I started near Boyodoro, or Boyoto, how it was called in late antiquity, and made it in the first day to Oberwein and Stanakon. It was very, very difficult, very hard. I arrived there only at half past one during the night in full rain, slept outside of the rain. You all know about this episode already from uh, my previous reports. And the next day I could make it um, in the evening to Schlögen. It was also very hard and the uh, equipment was weighing me down because it was wet. Then I had to uh, stop because uh, I had to dry the equipment. It wouldn't dry because it was perpetually raining. And I had to redesign the equipment. So I stayed at a friend's place and then um, uh, spent the whole, the whole day that was actually meant to bring me into this area here, where there is another legionary, um, or at least a civilian settlement at Efferdin. So this, this stretch I could make. I will make it uh, later, after this walk is over, and after I had some other things to do, I will come back to this stretch and walk it. Um, I started again then around this area, uh, near Linz, and walked all around here, made it to Linz, and yesterday we made it across here, walking to Lauriacum where we are currently. Today we will make it to Albin and possibly to Stein. And in the next days till Thursday, when I will make the next break for, for a few days, 
I will hopefully make it from Stein to Malsee, over Mauer to Ireland and Deutschland, and then um, in this area here is Melk, which has also some Roman traces. I will pick up them, uh, likely from Malta, going to Augustianis, Dresmauer, Zwentendorf, Tulln, Zeidelmauer, then in Dobola and Kalmuntum. Uh, the stretch between Böchlern and Mautern I will also have to do probably at a later stage um, to catch up uh, because we have a schedule to keep and as we've seen it has been very difficult to, to keep up with the schedule with the current equipment. So here we have a map of the province of Noricum, how it was before it was split into two in late antiquity into an upper part which was Noricum Ripense the riverside Noricum and a lower part which then became Noricum Mediterraneum. Not because it's bordering the Mediterranean, but because it was closer to the Mediterranean. Here we see all the Danube garrisons again, and in the second line some of the civilian cities like Iovavum, Ovilava, uh, Adjuvense or Elium Ketium. These were civilian municipia. And the biggest town, actually, in this whole region was likely Virunum, in today's Carinthia, in the Zollfeld. Here we have a model of the legionary camp of Lauriacum. And you see very well uh, all the main features of a typical legionary camp. Here we have the centuries with the houses of the centurions at the one end. We have the thermal baths, we have the valetudinarium, the sort of dressing station of the legion. We have a uh, fabrica also. We have the houses of the tribunes. The fabrica is here. There's more uh, houses for the centuries and for the soldiers. The principia in the middle, where of course in the main building they keep the uh, vexilla of the legion. And we have the quarters of the first cohort, which is always much larger size over here and um, yes basically you have to imagine that all around this area would have been more houses uh, civilian uh, workshops and uh, trading stations etc with the whole sort of picos being around the camp and much of the shape of the camp and of the, the main features here were in fact discovered published by Here we have a very interesting piece. This is a tile, a roof tile, uh, with an imprint and it says uh, this is a product of the Legio II Italica and it was produced during the time of His Excellency Ursicinius. Ursicinius is of course the very famous Dux of Noricum, Ripense and Pannonia Prima during the reign of Valentinian I. So we have a lot of pieces where we find the traces and the name of Ursicinius. He's actually one of two known uh, duxes of this area that we know by name. It's actually possible that a lot of these products were either made in the Fabrica of Wilhering, where I was two days ago, or at the Fabrica, which we will visit today, near Stein. This is a monumental tabula, monumental uh, commemoration edifice made by Septimius Severus, which was also found here. It's basically detailing all his victories, all his uh, different titles, and also that he had the edifice erected here. This is part of the Roman bridge over the river Enns and it is dated to late antiquity. You can see how ingenious and effective they treated the metal here to ram the wood into the riverbed in order to construct the bridge. Most of these tools are also dated to the third or fourth century. It's sometimes hard to differentiate. But of course, um, with the fourth century being very active here on the Danube with a lot of building going on, 
and with it being more recent than the third century, we are bound to find a lot more stuff from late antiquity in, in, in many places here than from earlier centuries. Here the dating is also mostly third or fourth century and I believe a lot of these, like for example these axes here, so-called Schaftlappen, Exte, um, are pretty securely datable to the fourth century. Saw. A rasp that is dated somewhere between the 2nd and the 4th century. I'd love to see the other side, see the profile. And I'd love to have it replicated. So useful. These tiles and bricks show some animal traces. They are just walking all over the place. And even here, some idiot just stepped on it. There's another few brutes just walking all over the place, over these things, while they were still drying. A cow walking over it. A very nice depiction of a guitarra. Seems to be a very simple design and it has five strings. Funny shaped plectrum, how he plays it. Here we see the location of the grave sites that were found around the legionary camp. What we can notice is that from period to period uh, grave sites, uh, burial sites changed. So there was always uh, preferred areas for some periods and then suddenly they changed completely. What we see also is that um, many of the people found inside are between 20 and 40 years old, which seems to be linked really with the um, legionaries and their families here. Um, we also see that uh, the graves in late antiquity changed form and um, ritual completely. It might have to do with the onset of Christianity. And here we have a male individual who probably died between 20 and 25 years of age. C was about 162 centimeters, so 1 meter 62, uh, about 73 kilograms estimation. Probably very muscly, bulky guy. Uh, we see a lot of traces on his uh, joints that he probably was quite a muscly man. He had some um, uh, traces of some illnesses that are visible on his skeleton and of course also malnourishment, infections, parasites, etc. So, he has uh, also a fracture in his shoulder, which may, may be um, to do with his death, because probably his shoulder uh, was uh, transpersed and some inner organs were probably mortally wounded. So he may have been a legionnaire, died in combat or in an accident. So, now we look at the reconstruction of this individual. Well, looks pretty much like your average uh, farmer from the region. <laughs> and what's super interesting is that we, we don't know from his DNA whether what his complexion would have been. So you can here get a, a feel for the different possibilities. Huh? Could have looked like this also. Could have looked like this. Could have been more Mediterranean. Very, very clever. The second individual here is a female who died between the age of 21 and 24, was 159 centimeters tall, had about 53 kilograms estimated. She had some chronic uh, sinusitis, carious, and uh, she had also some traces of heavy labor in shoulder and um, hip uh, joints. So let's have a look at the reconstruction. There 
we go. And could have been like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. There is an ongoing debate whether Loriacum was actually a municipium, uh, like Carnuntum was, or if it was just a legionary camp with a civilian settlement around, but with no official status of a municipium. There's a certain fragments um, that uh, basically uh, detail uh, the right of a, of a municipium that were found here. So there is one part of the researchers that argue that actually Lauriacum had the status of a municipium, but the counter argument is that um, these could have also been scrap metal, old metal, and came from other municipia such as Ovilavis or Alium Ketium, and that they were just brought here for, for reuse. Because there's actually no other traces in any of the stone monuments uh, that the status of Loviacum would have been that of a municipium, so it's, it stays debatable whether this gives uh, a real clue to the official status or not. Magnificent frescoes. One of the most spectacular frescoes that have been preserved in Austria, probably dating from the second or third century, has been found not so far from here in a villa. Absolutely beautiful. It shows two lovers in the center and the four seasons symbolically on the corner. It was discovered in the early 70s and really is a testimony to the standard of living that even in these remote Limes areas were achieved. What is particularly interesting here is that the male figure looks like modern depictions of an, of an angel with some wings. Now Viacum's apex was sometime between the second and later third century. Uh, in the fourth century, sometime between the reigns of Diocletian and Constantius II, the Legio Secunda Italica was split up on several uh, places like Boiotro for example and also several burghi along the way and was reduced and with all the military reforms there was a lot of change so uh, Lauriacum was reduced in size and the troops that are present were also reduced in size. Um, we have nevertheless uh, we have Lauriacum as a very important site in the Notitia Dignitatum and we have also the confirmed presence of Constantius II in the year 341, as well as uh, Gratian in the year 378. They both came through Loriacum on their movements through the empire. A very nice example of a type 2 crossbow fibula, very similar to the one discovered in Dern with the helmet and the bag. Of course, we have also traces of early medieval settlements here with this pottery dating to the 7th or 8th century. Crash test dummy display with typical misconceptions and mixing of late antique items. But anyway. We'll hopefully get a better display going at some point. Some more late antiquity pottery, very nice fibula of the later types. I believe this is a type six or seven. Here are some of the more ubiquitous type four. Very typical pottery. For late antiquity. This is a very common track map where we see how the region of Ennis Lavirco has changed over the millennia. This is the original setup with the Danube and the rivers Ennis and how uh, 
building a large um, river landscape with lots of islands, etc. And here we see how it must have looked like in the late first century. Now we are in the first half of the third century with the bridge, the legionary camp, the vehicles around the world. Here we are in late antiquity, in the fourth and fifth century, bigger vehicles, and then this is the 19th century. This is the 60s. from 2016. It's really changed a lot. The largest part of the really wealthy catalogue of finds was actually catalogued by Dr. Uber in the 90s and he prepared also the exposition that was shown here between the mid-90s and early 2000s. Now there's a new exposition, a new format and interior of the museum, but the previous ones was largely influenced by Uwe, who also was the finder of many of the items here. And many of the items here have been published also by either him or some of his students, colleagues, and also my aunt has contributed to a lot of the objects, found the objects that are here in the exposition now. Very spectacular fishing net. Absolutely brilliant exposition. Well worth a visit, especially if you're interested in provincial Roman culture. Some more chainmail fragments, very small rings here. And famous mystery object. Pottery again, exceptionally well preserved. White lamps, glass, very typical for late antiquity again. And a whole collection of fibulas from the early imperial times up to early forms of crossbow fibulas and all the way. Quite big ones actually. This must have been for some sort of dignitaries. And here we have something very, very common also in late antiquity. These solar flare round fibulas. Very, very nice. We just crossed over into Niederösterreich and here is a canal of the river Enns. And on the other side is the plateau where the legionary camp of Albing was situated. We are standing here in the middle of the huge legionary camp of Albing. As you can see, this is a pretty ideal place in terms of the view. You can see the big plain here with a, with a very nice view of all the northern Alps. And you can see the Ötcher at the back, the Danube is just here, there is a river, the Enns coming into the Danube and there was a wide river landscape here, so pretty perfect emplacement, you control a wide and vast area 
with your camp here. But despite the really ideal emplacement of it, it had to be abandoned because of course the Danube would regularly flood the entire plain or large chunks of the plain. And so they chose another place which is a bit more elevated and which today is Enz Lauriacum. It's situated on a little bit of a plateau higher up so whenever the Danube flooded this region they'd still be there and in safety from it. You also have a good view of the entire surroundings perhaps a little bit less um, ideal than here where you have really a, a, a broad view left and right of this little range of hills here and when you're in Lauriacum this little range here obstructs your view uh, to the east a little bit. So very ideal emplacement. We can't see anything of the camp anymore unfortunately. It was roughly exactly here and the northern wall of it has been eaten away by the Danube over the centuries. But there was some important excavations also conducted here and Professor Uwe was also part of that and we're going to go into more detail at a later stage.